Hello. I'd like to use this video to demonstrate a project I've been working on for a while. I'm a programmer by trade, but find electronics to be a rewarding hobby. Hardware is much more tangible than software. It has been my ambition to build my own computer for a long time, as this is a project that combines both electronics and programming. It also produces a useful tool. I can develop new software to run on the computer, and can also use the computer to develop and experiment with new hardware. Modern computers are increasingly impenetrable to the hobbyist. Take, for example, the despairing parallel port, which used to make interfacing your own hardware to a computer wonderfully simple. In light of this, I've gone for a simple design, with specifications that would be more at home in the 1980s. The main CPU is a Z80 running at 10 MHz. It has access to 64 kilobytes of RAM. The display is a 320 by 240 pixel monochromatic graphical LCD. Around the back of the computer, is a VGA socket for connection to a monitor, an RCA jack for connection to a PAL television, an RS-232 serial port, a parallel port, and finally a PS2 keyboard socket. What is more interesting, however, is what goes on inside. The computer has two main circuit boards in it. This small one is dedicated to generating the video signal. It is connected to the rest of the computer via this small ribbon cable. I'll remove this circuit board for the time being. In this corner is the power supply, providing a regulated 5 volts and 3.3 volts from an external unregulated power supply, such as a 9 volt wall wart. Next to it is an oscillator circuit, using a 20 MHz crystal and a 74LSO4 hex inverter. This generates a 20 MHz signal, which is divided by 2 by this D flip-flop to generate a 10 MHz signal. The Z80 runs at 10 MHz, but I thought it sensible to also have a 20 MHz signal for future proofing. The power and clock signal come down to the Z80, which is this large chip over here. Next to the Z80 is a 128K RAM chip. I was not able to find a 64KB RAM chip, only 32KB and 128KB ones, so I settled for the larger option and have tied the A16 pin low for the time being. Down here is an AVR microcontroller, an ATmega644P. This controls all input and output operations, such as reading characters from the keyboard or sending characters to the display. Whenever the Z80 performs an I.O. request, it triggers this D flip-flop that asserts the Z80's wait pin, effectively pausing its execution. The AVR constantly checks for an I.O. request, and when one is issued, it springs into action and performs the desired task before resetting the wait flip-flop to allow the Z80 to continue. The AVR is directly connected to the Z80's data and control buses, though it does not have enough pins to access the 16-bit address bus directly as well. To help, here are two 8-bit I.O. expanders accessed over SPI. The SPI bus is also used to access this 512MB SD card, which is used for storage. When the computer starts up, the AVR copies the operating system from the SD card to RAM, then lets the Z80 take over. Two more of the I.O. expanders are used to control 16 pins of the parallel port, one for the eight data lines, and the other for eight of the control or status lines. The serial port is driven by this ST232, to boost and invert the 5 volt supply to around plus or minus 10 volts. The serial data signals are generated directly by the AVR. The last chip on this board is this DS1307 real-time clock and calendar chip. This keeps track of the date and time, even when the main power is removed. That's what this battery is for. The AVR communicates with the DS1307 over the I2C, or inter-integrated circuit, bus. The I2C bus is also used to communicate with the video display controller. This uses a DSPIC33 to generate a 320 by 240 pixel monochromatic image on a graphical LCD, VGA monitor, or PAL television. It accepts roughly the same commands as we used on the BBC Micro's VDU, so it can be used to draw and fill shapes, such as lines, circles, ellipses, triangles, and parallelograms, as well as displaying text. I had never used Perfboard before this project, which is why I decided to construct the video display controller on its own smaller board first as a test run. The computer has been assembled on perf board using through-hole components and point-to-point -point soldering. 
This allows for a more compact design than would have been easily achievable with stripboard, yet is still easy to solder by hand. To allow you to see what I'm doing on the computer as I do it, I'm going to plug it into the video capture card on my desktop PC using the composite video output socket. This allows you to see what I'm doing on the computer much more clearly than if I were just pointing the camcorder at the screen built into the computer. The computer uses CPM3 as its operating system. This was a popular choice between the late 1970s and mid-1980s, and as such there is quite a lot of existing software for it. The A drive stores the operating system itself and several utilities. The B drive, however, has BBC Basic. This is an extremely handy piece of software to have. Naturally, it allows for the development of basic programs. This demonstration sorts an array of strings. However, if I show the program listing, you can see that the bulk of the program is written in assembly. BBC Basic's ability to easily mix high-level and low-level programming makes it very flexible and powerful. It's a structured dialect of BASIC, with name procedures and functions, and also provides an inline assembler, indirection operators to directly access memory, and put and get keywords to directly access I.O. ports. This is the generic CPM version of BBC BASIC, and as such does not support machine-specific features. However, by using the low-level capabilities of BBC BASIC, you have full access to the machine. For example, to retrieve the current date and time on this computer, you first have to read from I.O. port 2.0. This reads the date and time from the DS1307 real-time clock and calendar chip into the AVR in one single operation. We can then access the individual components of the date and time through other I.O. ports. Two three is for the hour, and two four is for the minutes past the hour. As these values are stored as packed binary coded decimal, I need to use the tilde next to the print statement to print as hexadecimal. When adding the parallel port to the computer, I experimented with the hardware in BBC BASIC before adding printing support to the BIOS. This let me spot and fix any bugs in the hardware or firmware much more quickly than I would have been able to do had I had to keep compiling and reinstalling the custom BIOS. If I say goodbye to BBC BASIC, I can switch to the E drive, which includes some programs I've written specifically for the computer. Clock is a graphical analogue clock that uses the primitive drawing operations offered by the video display controller. The numbers around the dial are quite a bit larger than the text we've seen so far. This is because the clock switches to a different screen mode that uses 8x8 pixel characters rather than the default 4x8 pixel ones. I can switch to this mode within the operating system by typing mode and then the mode number, which is 1. One of the advantages of this mode is that the appearance of each character can be modified. The most obvious use of this is to change the font. Here's one that should be familiar to ZX Spectrum fans. Another use of this technique is to display a bitmapped image by splitting it into 8x8 pixel tiles. Here's a picture of a cat displayed using that technique, stored as a standard Windows bitmap file. A good example of a sophisticated piece of CPM software is the text editor vEdit Plus. This is a visual text editor, allowing you to see what you're editing. A lot more pleasant to use than the standard CPM editor, Ed. Here I've loaded one of the documentation files of vEdit Plus into the editor, and I can move the cursor around using the keyboard. If I scroll down into a block of text, here I can just enter a couple of lines, move the cursor back up, and type anything in here that I like. So that's nice and easy to use, and as CPM is very text orientated, it's good to know that there's a friendly text editor for it. I shall just quit vEdit Plus. 
quit and we want to exit. Computers can be for fun as well as for work, and what computer would be complete without the classic text adventure Zork? On here it's stored on C drive. And I'll run it by typing Zork 1 for the first game. You are standing in an open field west of a white house with a boarded front door. There is a small mailbox here. So open the mailbox, reveals a leaflet. The leaflet. Zork is a game of adventure, danger, and low cunning, and so on and so forth. No computer should be without one, and this one isn't. So I'll just quit that for the time being. There. That's a very rough demonstration of some of the software. It's easy enough to write your own, though the advantage of using CPM means that there already is a range of software available to use. Using CPM also means that you don't have to write your own operating system, which saves an awful lot of work. I had previously mentioned that the computer could be used to develop new software or hardware. Here's an example of a new piece of hardware that I've been working on. I've never paid much attention to sound, so this is an attempt to remedy this. On this breadboard is an AT Mega 168 that emulates an SN76489 programmable sound generator. It can be controlled over the I2C bus. This bundle of wires taps into the computer's I2C bus between the main circuit board and the video display controller. The computer runs a piece of software that allows you to play VGM files. These files store video game music as a sequence of writes to specific sound chips and the delays between these writes. I shall finish with a tune, the title music to Striker's Run on the BBC Micro by Martin Galway, which some would recognise as a cover of Rydine by Yellow Magic Orchestra. Thank you for watching.